trying to we were got it uh we were thinking to uh start with jim so he can yeah. start with the slides and then feel free to jump in right uh it's more like an open discussion than really uh presentation uh okay got it perhaps maybe a few more seconds and we can allow them amanda is still there yes i'm here okay uh so it's already recording right do we have the confirmation yes, yes. Yes, cool. Yes, sorry, uh, I just great. Uh the slides is there. The slide is there. Uh perhaps yes, we can allow them to join. Yeah, I'll do that now. Do you introduce us or do we need to introduce ourselves? Uh Amanda will just say, okay, we have uh Jim <laughs> and and Kirk, and then you can introduce yourselves, you know, something like very quick. It's not like a bio. <laughs> Everybody. Have we started? Yeah, I think all the participants are just getting into the room. Um, I see that it's just waiting them to join and then we can start, all right? Okay, just admitting for more participants, and then that's it. Okay, everybody, so uh, officially starting uh, the webinar. Welcome to the Academy of Marketing Science webinar series. Uh, thank you to our speakers for being with us today. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. We are pleased to discuss how to manage co-authors, the strategy to build a productive and collaborative career. I'm Patricia Hossi, the AMS Vice President for Engagement, and with Amanda Yamin, our Director for Online Seminars, we'll host a great team of speakers today. So Amanda will be our moderator, and without further ado, Amanda, i let you introduce mm -hmm. us. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank again our three uh, speakers who are kindly agreed to share their experience and insights on how to manage routers. I think it's a topic that we don't discuss very often. Um, we plan a one hour webinar in which each speaker will have around 10 minutes uh, to present their perspectives and experiences. And we will devote the rest of the time for an open discussion between the among the speakers and the audience. So uh, today we have the pleasure to host Nina Cray. Uh, let me just pass the slide. Uh, Nina Cray, uh, an associate professor from Rowan University. Uh, Jim Bowes, a professor of marketing and VP of publications of AMS from University of Carolina Greensboro. And, and uh, Kirk Plunger, uh, a, a, a professor of marketing in King's College, London. Um, so please send your um, questions either in the chat or raise your hand. I will keep track of the order of uh, presentations, but we will add the questions for the end of the presentations of the speakers. So we so we are sure that um, we have enough time for the presentations and then we have time for the discussion. Okay, so uh, I will leave the floor open to Jim. If you want to start. Okay, uh, we're going to have the first slide up. Uh, you know, choosing a co-author is a lot like choosing a business partner. And I apologize for my voice. I, went out to an event on the West Coast and got uh, sick on the plane or something at the event was sick. And I, my voice is terrible. But uh, you definitely want to trust people that you work with. And trust builds over time. So the first time you work with someone, you see how well it goes. And then you uh, may work with them again or may not. Sometimes you have one-time collaborations. You work with a person once on a specific project and that's the only time you ever work with them. Other times you may work with a person over a number of years. Uh, I've had several co-authors that I've written with for several decades. Uh, and again, they change over time. Some of the people I worked with early on, I don't work with now. Our careers have kind of diverged and we didn't necessarily work in the same area, but we enjoyed working with each other, but uh, we haven't published together for quite some time. Uh, Nina, Kirk, you. I'm 
Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I, I, I would say uh, um, that, uh, uh, well, early in your career, um, a lot of people, like after, after your, uh, you, you get your doctorate degree, um, people say, okay, now branch out. Um, <clears throat> may, may, maybe don't just always work with your, your supervisors or people at the institution that you got your PhD from. Um, and that's great. I, I agree with that. And, and I think that AMS provides um, and other conferences provide that that chance to network, to really present your ideas and, and get people uh, excited about those ideas, as well as, you know, uh, go in and, 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 and talk about other people's ideas as well. But my own personal experience is don't forget about that, that network that you spent, you know, three, four, five years um, uh, making um, in, in your doctoral career. So the, the people that uh, I love working with are are the, the people that I actually studied with. Um, sometimes my supervisors, but sometimes um, um, colleagues that that are were above me in, in, in the PhD degree or or below me. Um, but but th those are the people I keep coming back to. And and uh, yeah, that and really sort of develop that that relationship and, yeah, and i would say with, with, the, with their phd students as well now yeah and i think it i think it depends on um the program you went through if you're lucky and you have a very supportive program and um, a very supportive supervisor then yeah i'm i'm also still very close with mine so it's good to have that kind of in the back of your bag um as like one tool and that's where also a lot of referrals come back. Like they might not have time to work on a project that somebody contacted them about, but then they say, hey, I have a former student of mine. You know, they know what they're doing. So that's also how you get referrals. But at the same time, if you go through a program where you might not have a lot of support and you're not very tight and close knit, then there is hope. You can find other people to work with. Like you don't have to rely on them. So I think it goes both ways. If you have a supportive network, great. You can continue to utilize it. And if you need to find new people, there's definitely chances at conferences, at attending workshops like this. Um, so both ways work really well. And I have uh, utilized both ways in my past, um, finding co-authors like that. I, I just wanted to add uh, that also we, we all work at universities and, and um, sometimes some of the best co-authors are people that um, either are in, in your department, um, your, your marketing group or whatever, um, but maybe also it, it's it's talking uh, over lunch uh, to someone in entrepreneurship or strategy uh, about something and then, hey, you have a paper um, or a, an idea for a paper. So, so be, you know, be a, a, a be social even at work. <laughs> you know, one thing you can also, if somebody's working in your area, don't don't hesitate to reach out to them. They may or may not work with you, but uh, you know, you never know. And it certainly doesn't hurt. I've had people reach out to me. Sometimes I worked with them, sometimes I didn't. If when I didn't, it wasn't that I didn't uh value them reaching out. It just I was swamped with too many projects. Uh, but certainly reach out to people, meet them at a conference. AMS is a very good networking con conference. Per Kirk mentioned that. But uh, I found it to be an extremely friendly conference. And there's a lot of time where you can do some networking at receptions and uh, during sessions. You know, one thing when you look at co-authors, you certainly want to find some of those work styles complement each other. Uh, I was talking to Barry Babin. We did a lot of work early on, and uh, we were talking. We were laughing the other day. He said, "Yeah, I was. He was the perfection-oriented person. I was the person who wanted to get out the door." And uh, right now, I'm working with a former doctoral student, and it's exactly the same thing. He's the perfectionist. I want to get it out the door, and you know that's that's not a bad combination because the perfectionist will keep you from sending it too early, but the production-oriented person will make sure it gets done. Uh, Work schedules are another thing. Uh, you know, if somebody's got a heavy teaching load, you have to work around that and you have to factor that in. Uh, 
similar topics areas. Some of my co-authors work in different areas, but we find a topic that we can kind of agree on right now. At uh, our university, I'm working with some of the hospitality people in wine research. And again, the skill complementation is very important. Uh, you know, you want somebody that's a good methods person. You also need a good theory person. You need a good quant person. So you kind of build a team that does those things. And uh, finally, and this is certainly important, if you're working with someone whose promotion requirements are very different than your universities, there could be some conflict in uh, where you target papers. Obviously, everybody wants Financial Times Journal, but not everyone needs one to get promoted tenure. And so you have to factor that in as well. Yeah, I would just add about like sections in an article. I think after you write a couple of papers, you kind of get a preference. It's not like you cannot write other sections, but there are certain sections that kind of produce themselves easier. Like for me, for example, I hate writing the introduction. Like <laughs> I hate writing it. I hate reading it. I don't see the point. So I'm always looking for people that love writing introductions and can write really well ones. So that's like not my forte. So when I um, find, find collaborators, it's important for me to discuss like where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses and what do they feel comfortable contributing um, specific sections or methodology theory, what we already talked about. And then also I wouldn't shy away from learning a new methodology if that's beneficial for the project and for, especially if you work with people on multiple projects. So I've done that before that I was asked to like learn a new methodology and I did just for that project and then I used it moving forward, right? Because again, it helps your toolbox, what you can contribute to a project. So not necessarily always limit to what you know right now, but what you can do in the future. So that's something to consider as well. Great. And I I, I have, I've, my role in in uh, a lot of my papers uh, currently are, is more on the theory or introduction writing side, um, <laughs> and uh, but it hasn't always been that case. Um, especially when I started out um, as a PhD student, um, my main expertise was you know, I was a data data monkey. Like I just um, was about collecting the data, then analyzing it, and learning these new techniques and um, uh, but as I, you know, progress, um, I, I I have um, people I can rely on to to that are very specialized in in different uh, uh, methods and and uh, and I, I I like to do mix mix methods and you know you can't be um, you can't be an expert on everything so. Um, so I, I really rely on on those people, you know, that are really good at uh, ethnographies, at at modeling uh, experiments. I mean, I I can do them all, but um, but you know, that's one of the real benefits of, of having co-authors. Um, the other thing I, I would also say is um, don't shy away from asking questions um, uh, about things that other people did on a paper. Um, so, you know, that that's, it's especially when you're working with a, with a senior person, don't, don't worry um, that you you changed a, a sentence or a paragraph or uh, even, you know, um, the direction of, of uh, uh, a certain section, right? Um, I, I think that's all, all about co-authorship, right? So it's all about uh, work working together to improve something um, that uh, because everyone has a, their own ways of of contributing to a paper. Um, perhaps if you guys uh, allow me, uh, we have a question. Um, just so we don't miss, you know, the, the, the discussion that you had, there is a question here on the chat that what if your own skills are equal across all sections? Right. And you're very, you're very versatile, then you can contribute anywhere in the project and anywhere on the paper. So if you don't have a preference or your skill set is so diverse that you can apply it to everything, 
that makes you a very good candidate to collaborate with. Um, but then it's just a discussion of who's going to do what for the specific project. So figuring that out at the beginning, I think, is very important, what we're going to discuss later as well. Um, so just making that vocal and then discussing it as a team. So if you have more skill set, that's always better than not having enough. So definitely not a disadvantage. Kirk, you want to add to that? I, I, I think uh, Nina said it all. Um, that, uh, you know, I, we're, we're going to talk about working as a team in a, a few minutes, but, uh, but just divide and conquer. Right. And, and to be honest, sometimes you, you write something and then you work on another part of the section and your, your co-author rewrites what you just did. That's fine. That's, that's part of, uh, making that 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 article more impactful or and and offer more contributions yeah i think that pretty well covers it uh you know if you're very versatile you can do any of the parts so if you've got a co-author who's a great writer of the theory section that's where they focus and you do some of the other things you know as uh a vp of publications we often uh not often but we do run into ethical issues dealing with certain publications my key thing is make sure you know who you're getting involved with we did a presentation probably five or six years ago at ams about publishing ethics i did some background reading i was stunned at some of the things i found uh people manufacturing data sets and uh one graduate student who manufactured a data set and approached a, a big name in the field, said, yeah, I've got this data. Would you work with me on it? They published an article. It turns out the data was all fabricated. So that big name person, their reputation was harmed because they didn't investigate that co-author. And the person completely made up the data set. Uh, you know, uh, as far as contribution makes an author, uh, the, the Academy's Publishing Code of Ethics addresses some of this. And I would certainly refer people to our code of ethics for publishing, uh, you know, as you, uh, whether you're sending it to one of our journals or to another journal, I would certainly look at that and, uh, and think about some of the issues there about what makes co-author. Yeah, I would, I agree with having to investigate somebody that you want to work with, especially if you really don't know them at all and you, your path have never crossed before. Um, I've done that before in the past where I reached out to people that I trust and that I know and just asked the question, like, can you tell me anything about that person? And uh, if the feedback is good, great. I'll, I'll investigate the opportunity further. But if they're hesitant to give me a referral on that person, that's already a red flag, right? And then it's very tempting to jump on a project because of the glory of getting published and, oh, we want to go to an A-star journal. It's not worth it long term though. If there is something wrong with the data, like Jim said, or anything else fishy, um, it can seriously hurt your reputation. So then it's better to do some due diligence at the beginning and not get blinded by this possibility of having a top journal publication. So because our reputation is very, I would say fragile and everybody knows everybody in this community. So one, two big uh, mistakes, and that's pretty much it. And nobody wants to work with you, and that's really not worth it, and it's not good for your career. So always be a little cautious. Not that you have to question everything, but, you know, it's good to keep an eye on things. Yeah, I, I would just say or re re reiterate a point that I just uh, made before is be part of all parts of the, the paper. Uh, or in all parts of the process. So if someone else is collecting the data, um, you know, that's fine. I mean, that's a very normal thing, but 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 that doesn't mean you never look at the data. Um, and if the if the data is is suspicious or you're like, well, how you know how how did you we get there? what what was what were the what was the questionnaire that that was sent out or, you know, like, be inquisitive about that, especially if something looks a little bit strange. Um, and and that, you know, that's uh, 
that's a way to sort of protect yourself. Um, you know, obviously there's different types of teams. Some are some are total collaboration. You go, you flip a coin to see who goes first. You go alphabetical order. Uh, you know, or or sometimes there's clearly a first author. They do most of the work, and uh, you come in with a particular part portion or uh, something. Or maybe you're a reviewer. I just had somebody in our from the entrepreneurship group send me a paper say we're going to a marketing journal. Would you review this? And if you're interested, we'd consider bringing in as a co-author. So that's very different than if you're involved from the from the get-go. Uh, you definitely want to understand up front how the work is distributed. Uh, sometimes you work with somebody and they just take off and write the whole paper almost with in, no input from you. Then you end up having to rewrite it. Uh, then you go back and forth. Uh, so sometimes it's better to up front understand what each person's role is going to be. Again, always review the data. Even if not the quant person, look at the data. Make sure it's been analyzed correctly, that somebody hasn't left out certain uh, uh, parts of the data that don't necessarily confirm what you're trying to prove. Because uh, sometimes if the results are too good, they are exactly that. They're too good to be true. Uh, Kurt, Nina. Um, I, I, I've had a whole bunch of different experiences. Sometimes it, you know, you you are coming in as uh, uh, as as Jim said, like the paper is, you know, two thirds of the way written, and you're just coming in to sort of uh, uh, finish it off for for some some reason that, or maybe maybe it's been rejected a few different places. And then you, you're coming in to sort of say, you know, try to save the bacon or something. <laughs> um, or I should say, save the protein, you know, <laughs> to be more inclusive. But but um, but I actually, I love to have true collaboration. Um, typically, I try to always involve a, a, a PhD student, um, someone, you know, uh, uh, more senior than than me and and uh, and then someone sort of mid career or early career and 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 that's just has a really great uh, feeling and and we're all learning and we're getting you know uh, it's a real uh, melding of minds um, and I, I've had I've been lucky to have a, a, quite a few uh, true collaboration um, experiences in in my career so far um, but. You know, it's always easier if someone or if someone takes the the reins and um, and uh, you know is very directive of what you have to do. This you, I I have a, a co-author that I actually have published a lot with. I don't know if he's in the room, but um, he gives you homework. <laughs> so uh, and I I love that because you're like, oh, I've done my homework for for the next meeting. So, but yeah, there, there's ton, tons of different ways to, to work together. Yeah, I agree. Um, Predominantly all my collaborations are true collaborations where everybody is involved in every single step of the way and everybody has a veto right. Um, so it's not usually first author driven. Um, and I do enjoy that the most as well because I like working with people that are just fresh out or they have no experience. And like Kirk said, people that have a lot of experience. And I think that's the best way of learning things. And I'm not going to be the one saying, well, I know everything for you. Um, that's not a collaboration for me. Uh, the first time I worked on a project was where it was really first author driven. It was more like they made the decisions. They told us what we need to work on. And I did my little part. And then that that was it. It's okay. It's the benefit of it is not as time intensive, right? I mean, it's 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 quicker for you personally often. Um, but I, I miss having this process of developing the idea, coming out, doing all of the steps together. Um, so I I'm always a big fan of a true collaboration. And how to determine that is just upfront. You need to have the discussion if you don't know the people yet, right? You need to talk about so what are what are your expectations. 
That's why it says like, are you a co-author or a reviewer? So am I going to send you the paper when it's done? You read through it kind of like a friendly review and that makes you the co-author, right? Is that what I want you to do? Or do I want, want your input throughout? Um, and the best way to avoid any kind of conflict is to have the discussion up front. And sometimes it can be a little weird to really have like a plan of you do this, you do this, I do that. Um, but you can always go back to it. It doesn't mean it's set in stone. Things happen, life happens. So you can always adjust it. But again, the best way is for me is open communication and making sure everybody feels comfortable. Clear, Patrick, you have a question? Yes, I do. How are you, first of all? I hope you are in a good shape. I want oh. advice. Uh oh. <laughs> I am in a project uh, with somebody who is more junior than me, and we have been working for a very long time. Um, we are writing a paper out of this very long, you know, collaboration, and this person insists to send the paper out for review when, in my opinion it is very premature and not ready. There are two different opinions, um, very strong opinions. And the other person said, I'm the first author, I'm deciding. If you don't feel that the paper is uh, in a good shape, take your name out, sort of. And my question is, how do you suggest that this kind of, of thing should be dealt because the ethics says that I have been working for this project for a long time. I have worked in earlier versions of the work. I feel that it's not ready. I don't feel that it should be published without my name because I have done a lot of work, hundreds of hours. I don't think that it's ready to be submitted. And if it's submitted with my name and my colleagues see my name on it, I will be totally embarrassed that we think that I lost my mind. And uh, we always think um, or I always thought of the point of view of the younger academic that is taken, uh, taken you know, the, the senior senior take advantage of this younger academic and how it can he can be or she can be protected. Now I'm in exactly the opposite position that I wasn't expecting to be at any point in my life. So uh, I would like others uh, to, to enlighten me on what, we should do in this kind of conflicts, not in the beginning of the project, but later when you have already invested quite a lot of work. Thank you very much. I love you all and many kisses. Nina, you want to address that first? Um, I'm, uh, what, I, what I would say is, um, you you said it was it was a junior a junior uh, scholar right i you know it, i would say okay let's submit it and and when we get that rejection you say see this is what and carefully <laughs> mitigate it and has my but, name on but, you're but not the, going to say what the hell is he saying is he saying is, is this person Cleopatra, sending me right cleopatra you know you have lots of you have lots of publications um you you do and so Yes, it's not maybe ready, but but it's also a learning process. Um, so, you know, and and maybe maybe it, you're lucky and and it goes through to review, and you say, okay, so now we have to action whatever the the reviewers say. Um, but that's what I would say. But I I don't know, N Nina or Jim. Uh, Jim, do you want to take yeah, it? Nina. I have a screaming. Go ahead, Nina. She has a screaming child, I think. So oh, dog, uh, I don't know. Well, first off, it's probably not somebody you want to work with on a long-term basis on, on other projects. Uh, but I think Kirk is on to something. If you don't send out for a review, send it out for a peer review, and you know, and let the person know. I don't think it's ready, but this person won't send it out. You know, send it to somebody that you know that would understand the situation, and see what you know and say you want a hard review. And uh, when it comes back, then I think that would prove. And if they don't want to do that, then send it out to a journal. And if it gets uh, really trashed by the reviewer, you say, see, I told you it wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, yes, I agree. And I would take maybe try one more time to talk to that person about it. I don't know. I, I, I'm sure you have, and they're still stuck on their idea and you're stuck on yours idea. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because you can go the hard way and say, well, my name is on it just as much as yours is, and you're not going to send it out unless I have a final review and I can work on it. So maybe there's like a compromise where you can say, okay, I can put a little bit more work into it, put it in better shape, and then we can try. But if they're not open to that idea either, then yeah, I don't, it, it's really tough. Um, and I do understand this idea of, well, my name is on it and it's going to be embarrassing because again, after a while, you know, if you have a bunch of publications, then you want to uphold a certain standard. Um, I guess the best thing that could happen would be you send it somewhere and then it gets rejected and you can have more time to work on it. Um, I, I don't understand why they're so stubborn about it, though. Like, um, if, if one person in the team doesn't feel comfortable, I think you should take a little bit more time and work on it. I'm not saying take another year or take another two years. I'm saying take, try to polish it up in two, three weeks and see where it is at and then submit it somewhere. Um, that would be my idea, but we have another hand. Maybe we have another input. Yeah. Go ahead, Devsing. I don't know everybody. If I can uh, maybe uh, bounce on Cleopatra's uh, question and your answers, uh, maybe in this kind of situation, you can simply ask some of your friends to do friendly review. And especially in your Cleopatra case, you know, a lot of uh, very nice reviewers, number two. And probably they will give very accurate analysis of your paper that will help to your review, to your author, number one to realize that paper paper is really not ready for publication top journal, for instance. That can be remedied. And second, if your uh, first author had that kind of attitude, I'm the first author, that is a very strong signal of things is maybe not good for cooperation, if we talk about cooperation, because uh, our work is teamwork, regardless who is the first or second author, but again, we sign with our names at the end of the day. So we have to be all together on the, on the same page when we assign this paper to publication. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I agree with everything. Thank you, guys. Send it to us. We'll do a friendly review. <laughs> <laughs> a friendly review. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. This one, I think we all sometimes have had times in our life where we just had too many projects and we, we have trouble. If you like me, you have trouble saying no. Wow, that sounds interesting. And you get all these projects and you're not able to keep up with all the work. And so you're kind of holding up the whole project if you do that. So you have to, to monitor your time. Is this project something I really want to work on or is it just another project? Uh, and, you know, that, I think that's a really tough question because you know we all are interested in so many different things and it's hard to turn down projects sometimes you need to kurt uh nina i'm very bad at this as well um uh i'm i i i, I see it that i'm too op optimistic um while i think it's really important to have um projects in in a, in a pipeline um, some things are just sort of sparking some things that, you know, are, are on the road to first submission and some things in, in, uh, uh, more mature submission. Um, it, I, I do have, I do take on too much stuff, um, often, and, and often it's actually driven by my, my doctoral students that are like, oh, this is interesting. Let's let's submit to this special issue or or this conference. I'm like, okay, I mean, <laughs> why not? Like, and and then uh, and then you end up having to to help them, support them through that. Um, yeah, Nina. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm really bad at that too. I can't say no, especially if it's somebody that approaches me that I know. 
if it's a friend of mine and they say, Hey, I have this issue. Can you just fix this? Can you, you know, I'm like, sure, I can do it. And then I'm like, wait, where are you on the list of stuff I have to get done today? You know? And then, so I, I'm also really bad at saying no. Um, can you have too many projects at some point? Yeah. It's uh, because the best project is one that is done and submitted. And um, I'm also guilty of having like a few that are still lingering around from my PhD time. So uh, it's time to get those done. Um, but I think it's uh, it's good to have different stages, different projects, different ideas. And I think that's when it helps to have um, collaborations with different people and different groups of people. And then you can be honest and say, okay, right now it's really hard for me. I need to step step back a little bit um, I'm still here I'm still part of the team but I need like an extension for like a month or something and then I'm back I can focus on it so I feel like at some point you need to prioritize and then just get something done and then you can go back to the other projects um, that's at least what I try to do um, again it goes back to open communications because I feel like it's a I don't want to say no if I'm really interested in the project and um, if I think it has potential for, especially for future collaborations, but I have to then take a good look at my timetable and be like, to be honest, right now it's not a good time. Maybe come back in a month from now or two and then you can work on it. So I will be cautious even, it's very tempting when you're just done, you're fresh out to say yes to absolutely everything. Um, don't because you're going to learn time is the most valuable asset that you have at some point and it gets drained a lot with teaching and service and projects so be cautious of that so saying good saying yes is good but don't do what apparently all three of us do we'll say yes all the time learn from our mistakes we have a question here uh, in the chat before we move to the next slide. Um, so just to read it for you, can we fire a co-author midway through the project if they consistently not meeting the group's expectations? That's uh, a sticky question. Uh, it's possible if you fire them, they may claim that they have a part ownership of the idea. Uh, you know, I've seen this as an editor, I've seen it as VP of publications where people uh, were working with someone and they quit responding. They took that and ran with it. Uh, I've also seen it the other way when people were talking about an idea and started working on it, but somebody went off and published it. Then I've seen where they fired a co-author, but they didn't do it explicitly. They just quit communicating with this individual and the individual came back and said, gee, you know, I've, I've got intellectual property in that, uh, manuscript, but my name is not on it. And then it gets really sticky. So you need to up front talk about, you know, if you're not carrying your weight. And yeah, I would certainly give them every opportunity to do it. And then I'd be very explicit. I'm, we're taking you off the paper because you're not carrying your weight. I wouldn't just quit corresponding with them. I would make sure that I had it in an email, in writing. We're firing you because you've not done the job. Uh, or you're not carrying your weight on this project. And I'd be very specific about what I'd ask. And that can help you avoid some real problems down the road. Yeah, I, I would I would say this uh, something similar to, to what Jim just said. Um, firing someone on, on a paper is kind of like pressing a nuclear, the nuclear launch button. Um, to be honest, I mean, what's the real cost of just putting them as last author i mean yeah i could there could be situations where they've they've done things dishonestly or something like that but the thing is if, if halfway through the project they've already done some work and and then there, there's literally well at least in the uk there's no cost um i i know that in some places they you get um money for uh uh publications but uh but yeah not not here unfortunately uh Nina yeah so I was actually in a position kind of like that um I was all for firing the person I'm very like you don't do your job I'm done with you like we're, we're good um but my other authors took a more of a um politically correct approach so what we ended up doing was we had a conversation with that author and said look 
every time we ask you to do something, you don't do it, or you do it in a way that you know we're going to have to redo it. And, and that for me was like the worst, like, you know, on purpose, you're going to screw this up. So I have to go back and fix it. Even though I know you're capable of doing this, but you just like refuse. Um, and then we said, okay, we're going to have to come up with a solution for this because I'm not willing to work with you anymore. And the other people feel the same. So what we did is it was actually a multi article project. So we said, okay, the first, this article that we're working on right now, we're going to keep you on as last author, but in the future, we're going to cut all ties. The idea stays with us. The data stays with us. So you get this one publication out of it, but after that we're done and you don't have any, any rights or any skin in the game anymore for moving forward with this idea. And that was the compromise we came up with. Did it hurt? Yeah. The first time I saw the, the article published and I saw that name, I'm like, oh, you didn't do anything. <laughs> you wanted to sabotage us. But again, long-term, that was the easiest solution. And I think it was, okay, now looking back, I think that's, that was a good way of handling it. So basically they got one publication out of it. We got multiple and that was okay. But you have to make it very clear. I, I could not, like Jim said, I can't just stop talking to somebody and then are surprised when they get upset that they're not part of this project anymore, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's that was my my experience. And there is a hand raised as well. Yeah, hello everyone. This is Mac from Northumbria University. Uh, I have a question which uh, just opposite to Cleopatra, which she was saying that, like I have an experience that while funding uh, applications, you need some experience experience team. And uh, for instance, if you have a professor kind of uh, in your role and you as a junior invested so much time in an area, but you need that support from that senior person that you he or she should be in your team. And when the time comes and she said that uh, this project is not ready and if you will submit that, uh, it will be a, like a seniority image and the prestige is involved in that. And people know me and whatsoever you can say that. And uh, they said that they are not agreed to put this bid or this project onward and you have to wait for another year, for instance. And in that situation, I would ask your opinion on that, that but a junior person who is ambitious to have this in, in his CV or in his portfolio. So how we have to see this seniority image and the prestige that comes into projects involvement and how to uh, get this team building from a junior perspective. So this is my question, if you can enlighten your feedback. Thank you. Well, I know that a little later we're going to talk about uh managing teams a little more uh you know it's very difficult if the person's a big name and their name lends prestige to your application then it's it's very difficult and maybe not politically uh wise to just go ahead without them because they they may take offense uh that's just my take on it kurt and nina i i totally agree that's especially if they've lent their name um on on that application um I, I i yeah i mean um there could be many reasons why they've sort of take taken a step back um but but uh i, I wouldn't stop um or not put their name on pa papers or whatever i i yeah especially if if a government or some uh, agency is, is funding your, your research. Yeah, I agree. I think the best, or well, the best thing that can be done is continuously reaching out to that person so it doesn't get lost, you know? So like always staying aware, like, hey, we still need to do this, you know, just a reminder, if there's anything you want me to do, let me know. Uh, rather than um, attacking the person being like, oh, you didn't do your job or something. Um, but I would not let it go either. So don't go too long of a time period without revisiting it. Um, because again, we all get busy and sometimes it's just a matter of what's important right now. What do I have to take off immediately? And then I can focus on other stuff. So I would, I would be cautious of um, going against that person. I don't know if that was helpful. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we've talked about this some already. Uh, yeah, the communication is very critical. If somebody's not carrying the weight, you need to let them know. Uh, or if they're being slow to respond, you know, hey, you know, we need to get this out. And again, part of that goes is somebody's senior, they've already been promoted and tenured versus if you're a junior author and you really need this paper out, uh, you know, you hate to wait too long uh, to get the paper out. Uh, again, is, is the goal, Nina mentioned, having a multi-paper project or is it just a one-time paper? And I've been involved with both and, uh, you know, it's a little different, hopefully with a multi-paper project, uh, everyone's carrying their weight and everybody's, uh, you know, a good uh, participant. Order of authors, I've never ran into a problem with this. I've, in fact, sometimes when somebody did more than they initially had set out to do, I moved them up in the order of authors, moved myself down. Uh, I think that's important to uh, to consider. Uh, we brought in a author after a first, brought in some after a first revision, and uh, I didn't think the paper was going to get in. This individual really changed it up. Paper got in. I moved him up to second author, moved myself down. Because without him, it wouldn't have gotten in. No way. So, Kurt, Nina. Nina, go ahead. Um, yeah, order of authors, sometimes it can be um, a hot topic, I feel like. For some <clears throat> people, it's super important. Um, at some universities, you get more credit if you're the first author versus the last author or like how many authors are there. I think the uh, most important is to make that decision up front. Or if you, like Jim said, he moved somebody, like talk to the people about it. Um, I would always prefer to have one more conversation about it, say, look, they did this much. So I, I think we should move that person up. Um, I'm very hesitant on making changes after we start working on the project, unless something happens. I've also done this before where I said, hey, put me last. Because I know right now I'm not like contributing as much as I should be, but I want the project to get done. So that can be done as well. Um, time commitment, I think, is very important. Be clear about it. Um, and that kind of goes with like as a first also true collaboration kind of thing. Again, things can always happen. But when I start a project, I need to know if I'm only working on one section, I'm working on everything, like writing everything. Um, do we have multiple meetings throughout? Are we like having one meeting, everybody does their thing, we come back together and share what we found, right? So every team works differently. So setting that expectation, I think is very important. And then having a deadline or a timeline, for me, <laughs> that can always change. Like I'm working on a project now, we were supposed to submit it last year. We're now getting ready to submit it, right? So um, again, I'm guilty of that too. Nobody's perfect, but things happen. Um, and as long as you have co-authors that are flexible enough to work with you on it, I think it's it's fine. Um, so it's tentative for a reason because I think there are always things that are going to pop up and I've yet to adhere to one completely 100%. I mean, when we're like close to the deadline, I'm, I feel good. That's Sometimes it helps then if you have a special issue submission because it gives you a firm deadline. And if you if you are somebody that needs a firm deadline, go for a special issue at least in one of your projects and then have other projects where you can work on your own time. Um, sometimes that has helped me as well because I know exactly what I need to do and my time commitment at that point. Um, yeah, and then open clear communication is always important. The worst thing that can happen if you start working with people and then you get blindsided or they get blindsided because something changed. So that's not, that's not good. And that also means you're probably not working together anymore. Right, yeah. things like that happen. Um, I, I, I would just say on order of authors, um, it's not something I'm very precious about. Um, often, you know, in, in projects that I've contributed, I think more than my fair share, I'm, I'm also not the first author because, um, there, there was, a, a, a doctoral student that was just about to go on the market. So, so, you know, he or she contributed enough from from their level and 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 it was really important that they were first 
the I've done the same to, with um, people that were pre tenure. Um, in the, in the UK, it's uh, probation, so pre probation. Um, and uh, you know, like again, doesn't I have a bunch of publications already? I, I hope to get more if I was if I'm lucky. But um, to, to another another first author doesn't really make a big difference for my career, but it would make someone's uh, a probation document or a tenure document or or get them a job. Um, so so I I always think about that when when we're talking about that, and I'm also someone that will say, um, even to to the, the to our you know our uh, collective or the the group of, of co-authors say like actually you know um let's put uh i don't know so, someone first uh, and i think that it's going to mean so much more to them than than to you and sometimes i, t I do that sort of offline just uh, on a one-on-one -on -one call with uh with a co-author just you know i don't want to offend anyone uh before i su suggest something uh uh, publicly. And the other thing um, with this slide, and you, you can't see the next slide yet, but I, I would say uh, avoiding author conflict is all about just respect. Um, and and if someone is unresponsive, it might be because they're they're busy with teaching or admin duties or whatever, or or pers we have personal lives as well, right? Um, but that they might also be sick or, you know, I think after COVID, we sort of understood that people aren't uh, aren't robots, and and we can, you know, people are um, sensitive to that. I haven't moved, been moving apparently, um, but uh, Gre Gregory, you have your hand up for a long time. That's fine. Uh, follow. <laughs> I I have a question, <clears throat> and uh, this question. Uh, is in a sense the continuation of the beginning of this conversation. But uh, I would like to uh, branch out into two uh, different um, directions. The first one is uh, what is your opinion about uh, cross-cultural co collaboration? Because in our uh, global environment, we keep collaborating with many people who grew up in different cultures, who work in different cultures, who uh, adhere to different uh, cultural habits or or norms, and this is one thing. The other is uh, not only the seniority of your collaborators, but also the way uh, we manage uh, communications uh, across multiple time zones. This is also uh, yet another uh, sometimes monkey wrench uh, which could be thrown into the efficiency uh, of our collaboration, not necessarily effectiveness, but efficiency, certainly. And many people have their own personal agenda, as uh, Kirk just mentioned. And uh, uh, these people uh, need to uh, tend to their families, uh, to their personal obligations, to their work obligations, and to their um, preferences in life. So what are your vision practice and suggestions. Um, I guess I can start. I actually have, um, thinking about my collaboration, I think all of my teams are um, international collaborations actually, but thinking about it, now I might make a mistake if I'm somebody, well, except maybe one or two, but most of my teams are cross-cultural, meaning I'm, I might be located in the US, but I'm not from the US or I work with somebody at a different university in like Europe or Asia and other countries. Um, I think everything still applies. The only thing is you really need to um, be more on top of things regarding scheduling. Like, so you have meetings in, early in the morning in the US so that you know other people from around the world can attend those meetings. Um, I love working with people from across the world. I've again, I've only had good experiences so far. I would definitely encourage that. Um, you learn so much from it, and I know we all come from different backgrounds. But even if you're from the same country, you still have different upbringings. So that kind of variable is always part of your project and your collaboration. Um, 
I guess for me, just making sure we communicate closely at the beginning about our expectations to make sure everybody feels comfortable is even more important. Um, yeah, I mean, I've not had any negative experience with that. And again, most of my researchers are not where I'm at. I I also have have a very similar experience, you know. Like I think almost all of my papers are with people different than me. Either either if they're here uh, in, in London, they they're from a very diverse range of backgrounds. Um, but I I very rarely work solely with Canadians. Um, I, I'm from Canada. <laughs> um, but the, I think one of the big challenging things is when you have a, a co-author co in uh, Australia or New Zealand or Asia and, and one in North America, it's like there's never any time you can actually meet. That, <laughs> so you, you, you sort of parse it out and, and you contribute um, a lot online. Um, and so you sort of have a asynchronous conversation. But, uh, but yeah, um, uh, Gregory, that... that I, I think that's one of the real benefits of, of our pr profession to really engage uh, on a in, uh, conceptual or, or theoretical level uh, with, with people that are so different than from us. Yeah, the communication of what your expectations are is really important. Uh, I've done some work where I knew I was going to end up doing the final write of the paper. Uh, simply because, you know, my English was better than that my co-author. So I just expected to have to do that, even though I wasn't the first author. Uh, so, you know, I think the communication about expectations and being a little flexible, as Kirk mentioned earlier, sometimes you do more on a project, but you're not at the top of the list of authors, uh, simply because it means more to that individual than it does to you. Uh, yeah, and then I think it also <clears throat> plays a role understanding their requirements at their institutions might be different from yours. <clears throat> so you need to be aware of that. Um, that can play part of it. Like some people get money for publications, others need just a certain amount or they have to be first author or something like that. And then you can always make the decision at a team. Again, we're not, usually the people I work with, it's not very stickler. Like you have to be first author or second. It's like, whoever on the new project, okay, you're first author now, next one, I'll be first author or whatever, right? We're usually very generous, um, but making sure that the person that you work with feels comfortable with that approach is also an essential step because they might come from a place where it's more hierarchical and they're like, no, like you're senior, you need to make the decisions. And then you're like, wait, I wasn't prepared to do that. <laughs> so understanding each other is important, but Again, not just if you're from a different culture or from a different country. I think it goes back to just basic author co-authorship and respect for, for each other. Thank you. Actually, uh, there is uh, one more, uh, I would say, sub-subject uh, of this, because when we are talking about cultures, we may talk about people who grew up supposedly within the same culture, but have different leadership styles or different styles uh, in communications. And there might be uh, some fight for uh, who is the boss, uh, quote unquote, or uh, who uh, takes the lead and uh, does uh, more uh, work, or who takes uh, a lead and uh, positions uh, him or herself uh, as a reviewer of others' uh, work. And that might be um, detrimental to uh, the team environment and uh, in in your in your uh, experience, have you had this these types of uh, infight, and how uh, this could be uh, resolved or mitigated? I have not had that situation before. Again, I think a lot of it's communication up front. You know who's who's in who is the lead author. Who is the person pushing the paper? And you know, if you can't come to agreement on those things, maybe it's not a good team. Kurt, Nina. Yeah, I, if if you're having that kind of kind of uh, situation, 
maybe maybe that paper will never see the light, light of day. I mean, and that's also an outcome, right? I mean, I actually have lots of papers that for many reasons never really, really saw, uh, never really uh, um, came together. But, uh, you know, if don't force it. If, 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 it's, if it's going to, and the publishing process is long too. So um, yeah, well, I, I think we're almost out of time. Yes, thank you, Greg. Uh, so we are almost at time. Uh, perhaps just uh, a, a closing thought. We still have three questions from the from the audience that were not asked. Perhaps I can just summarize them, and each one of you would address one, and then this would be our closing thoughts. So these are the questions. What are the ways to find people with similar interests, and how to approach them for collaboration? The second one would be. What are your thoughts on working with a limited number of specific authors uh, if the team works exceptionally well? And then finally, how to prioritize the step-by-step -step goals of the paper writing team uh, that was planned on day one and also manage the complexities in deviating from this, from this path, right? So this would be the three questions that we still have. Um... I'm going to take the one working with a specific team. I think that's great if you have a very close knit group of um, co-authors and you work really well together. It's always a good foundation, I think. Uh, it would be nice to have um, consistently a group of people to work with. However, I would also encourage to have at least a few other people around that you can work with uh, just in case something happens um, to your established team, like maybe again, things get busy or somebody's priorities change or something like that. Um, I always believe in diversifying a little bit, not saying that you need to neglect that core group, but it's also nice to meet new people and to work with other people together. So I, I would I would have a, a balance, rely on the core team most of the time, but also have some additional authors maybe. I I say to the the question about uh, how to find people with similar in, interests and uh, and how to approach them for collaboration. Um, we already sort of mentioned that, um, but I I would say conferences and and they don't have to be all like international conferences. It could be something w within uh, the city you, you live in or or the the state or region. Um, that that's fine, but then there's all always these special issue conferences that are coming out, sort of boutique conferences that um, uh, would they offer a little bit more social time um, because it's just smaller, so it's, it's easier to to talk to 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 presenters and to other people in the audience. Um, but but yeah, I I just would say don't be shy. Um, and and just go and like ask questions and um and say hey do you have time for uh, five minutes over coffee or something like that and, and people will will um gladly uh, uh make time for that and if they don't well that that's also a signal that maybe they're not that they're they're not interested or they're too busy or whatever so you know be be respectful of that that, that as well. But what if you cannot go to conferences? Like, I feel like we see, can we keep saying conferences, but sometimes we cannot make it there, like physically, because it's too far or it's in a different country or a school doesn't pay for it or whatever. So how can you meet co-authors then? I guess now I'm asking the question. <laughs> well, but there, there's, I don't know, um, I, at least in London, uh, we, we always have people that, uh, we always invite people for research seminars and stuff like that. So it doesn't have to be a formal conference, but but a, a, meet, a meeting of people maybe beyond your own university. Um, and yes, maybe you do have to travel a, a little bit, but um, we all invest, we, we invested four or five years in, in our PhDs. Um, so I'm sure we can invest a little bit more to... Uh, uh, try to find uh, people that are interested in, in, in the things we're interested in. 
And I've also just received emails from people that introduce themselves. Not that they, I think it's different if they introduce themselves and, you know, want, want to chat versus like, hey, I have this project. I want you to commit to it. And then I'm like, oh, right. I'm scared. Um, I have no time. But that's also a way, I mean, you know, introduce yourself somehow, LinkedIn or email or something. Start off a conversation. If you really cannot truly really travel somewhere, if that's not an option for you in the next year or two. Yeah, I'll address the question on the prioritizing the step-by-step goals of the paper. You know, typically we just say, okay, let's write a paper on, on a particular topic. We don't necessarily lay out an exact plan. We always have a, a finishing date in mind, but often we don't make that. Uh, but it's always good to have that laid out so people have a sense of urgency about getting this done. Uh Things do change. You hope that your writing team would be flexible. I mean, life happens. Somebody may have a, a family issue that's overriding doing research, or maybe you get into a paper and it's just not turning out the way you thought it would, but you've got data, so you may take off in another direction. Uh, again, it, it helps to, to find co-authors that are flexible and uh, don't mind carrying a little extra at certain points in the project. And also being the person that doesn't mind carrying a little extra at certain times during the project. Thank you, everybody. So this was our last question. Uh, I know perhaps it would be interesting to continue, but we have to finish today. Uh, thank you so much, Nina and Kirk and Jim for joining us and for sharing your experiences and the insights. Thank you everyone in the audience as well for the participation. And uh, we hope uh, we hope to see you on our next webinar series or perhaps uh, in Florida, right? In May. Thank you everybody. See you soon. Bye. 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 We will stop recording now.